Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is the one of the, the single most powerful messages, scriptures, messages, whatever it might be in my life. And I want to read it for you. And uh, if you have your Bible, you should open it up and read along. It's very simple. Um, I have my Bible here beside me, and I just wanted to show it to you because this is one of the first scriptures that I that I ever highlighted. So one of the first scriptures I ever I memorized. I, my this Bible was given to me on my 13th birthday, and uh, and as a teenager, I didn't read it very much, but you can see here the faded green highlighting of this scripture which says this trust in the lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths trust in the lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths and that is the cornerstone of my life. Um, it's one of the scriptures that I return to in, as I sang this morning, these little moments of life that like walking to school or like dropping my daughter at her gymnastics class, that if in all of our ways, we will acknowledge the Lord that he will direct our paths. It's a covenant promise. That word covenant is, is an interesting one. It's an if-then statement. That if we'll trust him, if we'll acknowledge him, if we'll seek his understanding over our own, then he'll direct us. He'll make our paths straight as another, um, as another um, translation says. And, and when we look at that, we have this amazing promise of God that says in every part of our life, in every season, in every high and stormy gale, that God will be with us. Through transitions and through different schools, and I'm deliberately moving slowly so we just get it. Through the moving away or the death of friends, through relationships with others. For me, through relationships, my relationship with my wife, the, our marriage, the birth of my children, to trust in the Lord and to trust in him with all of our heart. And in all the complexities of life, where to work, where to live, what, what car to buy, what house to rent, what property to purchase, to lean not on our own understanding. And in all of our ways, when we go to the grocery store, when we go to church, when we try and fix the plumbing in our showers, as I shared last week, when we take a lunch break, when we invest, when we pay our taxes to acknowledge him, and those are those three statements, trust, lean not on our, own, on our own understanding to acknowledge him. And then what? What's the if then statement? Then he will direct our paths. He'll direct our paths when we choose the schools our kids will attend, which is something we're doing right now. He'll direct our paths when we need to pick ourselves up after getting knocked down. He'll direct our paths through our relationships. He'll direct our paths when we minister to friends through ups and downs, through grief or loss or heartbreak. He'll direct our paths through the seasons of life, the cycles of life, birth and death, adolescence, adulthood, parenthood, old age. That he'll direct our paths through all these things. And this morning, I, as I mentioned at the outset, I want to talk about one area of life in which I think we all struggle from time to time to truly trust in the Lord. 
And it's an area we tend to lean on our own understanding, not God's understanding. At least I do. It's an area which we can easily neglect to acknowledge God. And as a result, an area where we miss out on the joy and blessing of walking on God-directed paths. And that area is money. And more specifically, giving. Giving in offerings and giving in tithes, which I'm going to get into. So I just want to pause and say thank you, Jesus, for today. Thank you that you're here among us. That through even the, the little ups and downs of this morning service, you're right here and you're at complete peace. So we accept your peace right now. I ask for your peace, your open hearts. For all who are listening, both in our Zoom community and online on Facebook Live. That you will speak. You, you promise to speak. And in especially in times where we feel a little bit rocked, that there you are completely at rest, asking us to have more faith. So as we wade into talking about financial giving in the church, I ask that you'll direct our paths in Jesus' name. So a few questions I want you to consider when it comes to money. And here's, here's my disclaimer, everyone. I'm going to I'm going to share some thoughts and then we're going to launch an exchange and we're going to use the exchange to just have a conversation. I'm, I'm not claiming to have the uh, highest authority on this subject. Um, I want to make a disclaimer as well. I'm not on staff at the church. Um, I'm a participant, a member, a uh, volunteer. And, uh, and I think in some ways it actually makes me better qualified to share a message on tithes and offerings because I have no stake. And, uh, and, and there's, I'm not saying that because Pastor Ron or anyone else does have a stake and is on staff that, that, that the message is somehow diluted. But um, I think that one of the misconceptions about tithing that's out there is that um, the church always needs your money and is trying to, to, to inspire people to give. And, and there, and that's because we have, salaries and things like that and some of that's true but it's I want to be really clear that it's ours to discuss these things with an open heart and an open mind knowing that while there are financial realities to the church there's scriptural ordinances that are that are we can find and we can discuss and if we can't discuss something like this openly and vulnerably and courageously um, we are lost it, we're just lost it's such an important subject for each of our lives. There's, there's virtually no element of the human experience that doesn't have some attachment to our finances. And, uh, and so we have to be able to discuss it. And so this morning, I want to share some ideas. I've assembled a bunch of scriptures that we can refer to or not. Um, but I'm going, to, I'm going to speak for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we're going to launch an exchange. And so keep your thoughts and your emotions and your questions front of mind, because I'm going to ask you to share them. Um, in, a, in a couple of minutes here. Cool. Here's a few starting questions. Do you trust in the Lord with all your heart in regards to money? Do you lean on your own understanding or do you lean on God's wisdom when it comes to money? Do you acknowledge God with your money? And if so, how do you acknowledge God with your money? And the big one, are you experiencing a God-directed financial path? And the last question, I think, is the critical one. How do you know if you're walking a God-directed financial path? And to that, I'd say this. How do you know if you're walking any God-directed path? How do you ever know when God is in your experience leading and guiding you? And to answer that, the question for me comes, how much peace in my heart do I have? How much awareness of God's presence am, am I, do I have? When I think of the attributes and the character of God, how much of that permeates my experience, despite the, the fact that we have trouble and we have waves and wind. Though the path might be rocky or narrow or filled with trouble, are we experiencing God's love, his peace, his joy? Is there quietness in our hearts? 
And Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and it lists them out. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. And so I'll rephrase my questions. You don't need to answer, but I just want you to call to mind your thoughts and wills and, and feelings and emotions as I ask you these questions. Does love cover your finances? Would you say that your financial situation is a joyful one? Do you have financial peace? Are you patient or impatient when it comes to money? Do you buy before you have enough or can you wait? How about financial faithfulness? Would God call you faithful with your finances? Is your goodness and your kindness and your gentleness visible in your financial reality? Is your gentleness evident to all, as Philippians says? And your generosity, which I think is synonymous with goodness, kindness, and gentleness, is it evident? And a huge one, do you have financial self-control? Are you financially disciplined? Are you in debt? Do you control your money or does your money control you? Now, I'm not asking you to answer these questions. I'm asking you to search your heart and search your feelings as I ask you those questions and just be honest with yourself. Do you see money as a blessing or as a curse? Do you see giving as a blessing or a curse? In general, are you at peace about money or are in general, are you anxious about money? I'm going to say it a bunch of different times, but I just want you to be real about your emotions as I talk through this. Again, I'm not here to, to say what's right and what's wrong. I'm here to present ideas. And as we get into this, you'll see with more clarity how there's not actually these, these rigid legalistic answers when it comes to giving and, and tithing, but rather a very sliding scale <laughs> Of, of indicators that audit whether or not we're on a God-directed financial path or a self-directed financial path. See, in all things, I believe God has an economy. He has a way that things work best. And God's economy always puts himself at the center. His economies always orient us around God. The way that God's kingdom works, the way that God's order works, always requires faith and it's often super hard <laughs> it's hard to understand which is the point of why i shared proverbs 3 5 and 6 it god's economy always requires that we lean not on our own understanding god's economy always requires trust it often requires obedience it always requires faith and here's the thing it always results in blessing the fruits of the Spirit manifest in our lives when we operate inside God's economy and when we out operate outside of God's economy and we don't experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And then we wonder why we're not experiencing these things. The answer, I think, is pretty simple. We're operating outside of God's economy. And I don't think it's ever more true than in the area of giving and financial freedom. One of the things that I would challenge you with it, to think about is that God's economy is never instituted because of what God needs. God doesn't need anything. He's all sufficient. He's all powerful. He's in absolute authority over everything. He sets an economy in place because we have needs <laughs> and he only gives good gifts to his children. He doesn't give any rotten gifts to his children. And so in the area of finances and giving, which the Bible has a lot to say about, <coughs> excuse me, it's because we need it, not because he needs it. And if you have entrusted your life to God and or you want God's economy and the fruits of his nature and spirit to manifest in your life, in your financial life, and you desire that God's kingdom be established in your life and his will be done in your life and all of these things that we pray, then you need to operate inside, not outside of God's financial economy.
Amen. There's a financial implication to every human experience we've got. And if these experiences happen outside God's economy, if they happen without God's wisdom, if they unfold according to our understanding, not God's, then necessarily they will lead us off of a God-directed path onto a self-directed path. And we will miss out on the fullness of his love and joy and peace and patience and all of the fruits. And I believe it's that simple. It's a simple message I'm preaching today. So how can we ensure that our financial lives remain inside, not outside of God's economy? I believe that financial giving is the key. And here's the punchline. Until such time as your financial life is brimming with the fruits of the Spirit, there's discipline to be established. And the starting place of establishing that discipline is tithing. Tithing means giving the first 10% of your income, entrusting it to the ministry you're under, typically the local church, in order to financially resource the furtherance of the kingdom of God. In our case, here at Penticton Victory Church. Tithing, which literally means the tenth, can't be confused with giving, regular giving. Giving has no minimums and maximums. It has no amounts. It contains no directives in terms of how much or where or how often we are to give. And we are called to give. Tithing, on the other hand, is a precise amount, the first 10% of our income, consistent, repeatable, dependable, that is what tithing is. And so oftentimes when I'm in this conversation with folks, we talk about tithing, but, tithe, but, but the tithe isn't 10%. Well, it's not a tithe because tithe literally means the 10%. It's giving, and there's nothing wrong with giving. In fact, there's everything right with giving. It's just that we need to differentiate between the tithe which is this consistent, repeatable, dependable amount of money that we can give if we want, or giving, which has no directives, no amounts. Now, both are acts of worship in the context of the local church, but the dependability of tithing allows the ministry of the church to function with financial confidence. It, it allows the church to be financially proactive and prudent so as to maximize the impact of our reach and our witness. Paying the tithe is a spiritual discipline that's dependable and, and repeatable. Now, I'm just going to camp on tithing. I want to put giving aside for a second. The tithing economy is one that's outlined in Scripture. It's Old Testament law. It actually predates Old Testament law, which we may or may not get into, depending on where the conversation goes. Um, but it does all of these things. It puts Jesus at the center. It orients our financial life around God. It requires faith and it builds faith. It requires discipline and it builds discipline. It results in blessing. It results in a dependability and a, and a confidence and a reliability of financial peace for the body of Christ, the, the local church as it, as it manages its um, you know, wisely and prudently manages its financial reality. And it requires trust and it requires obedience. There's just no way to put it elsewhere or uh, otherwise. And granted, tithing is a discipline that's hard to understand. And the, the reason that it's hard to understand is it defies merely human logic. If I give the first 10% of my, of my resources, somehow that will give me like more financial peace sounds like it will give me less financial peace because I'll be giving the first 10% away. And I return to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to talk about the, the necessity that we lean not on our own understanding. And we consider whether or not there's a purpose, a gift, a blessing in this gift that we know God only gives good gifts to his children. And so if he's asking this, then maybe there's a purpose beyond actually having less in the immediate. We have to understand that every, spirit, like every spiritual discipline, every discipline of faith, 
including giving of tithes, is instituted not because of what God needs, but rather because of what we need. God only gives good gifts to his children. God's economy exists for two reasons. First, for his glory. And second, for our benefit. So here's the thing that I want to do. I've, I've compiled a number of scriptures. I've compiled some stats and some different things that we may or may not get into. But I want to be super real about this conversation. And for that, I want to launch an exchange that simply asks, what are your thoughts and emotions and questions and feelings about tithing? I'm happy to get into, you know, how, how tithing predates the law and whether tithing is a, a uh, directive for now or whether it's old covenant, new covenant. But before, I want to make sure that we're spending the, our time on the right things. And for that, I'm going to launch an exchange. So here it is. I'm going to share my screen in a second. Copy the link. I'm going to pop that in the chat first. If you're just joining us for the first time today, or you're joining us for the first time on Facebook Live, there's two ways to join the exchange, actually three ways to join the exchange. The easiest way is to take your mobile device that's probably in your pocket, open up the camera, point it at the QR code that's on the screen, and you'll get a link that will bring you into the exchange in which there are three steps. Answering the open-ended question, considering and rating the thoughts of others on a five-star scale, one thought at a time. And then in the third step, which we're gonna to do together, we're gonna to discover where there's consensus around the, the thoughts and questions and, and emotions that we have as we talk about tithing. And I'll say this, what you put into this is what you'll get out. I am absolutely okay with being um, uncomfortable with the conversation if we're uncomfortable. I don't have a, a Bible to smash you over the head if you disagree with me on anything. Um, so I want to encourage you more than ever to be super real with your thoughts and questions and emotions. How do you feel about this? I asked you a number of different times in the preamble here to take stock, to become aware of where, how you're feeling. And, uh, and I want you just to dump thoughts into this exchange, unbridled. I'm not going to call anyone out. How do you feel? What thoughts, feelings, and emotions do you have in regards to tithing? And with that, I will close my mouth for a couple of minutes and start the clock. I'd encourage everyone to at least share one or two thoughts. And we're going to give this, we have lots of time this morning, we're going to give this plenty of time.
lots of great thoughts here. Continue. We will. We can give us uh, ourselves a little more time if we need. So if you're if you have another thought, uh, go ahead and share that. I'll watch the average ratings and make sure that all the thoughts are in this exchange. All right, some great thoughts and thoughts are still coming in. Once you finish sharing your thoughts, go to the star step and, and if a thought that someone else shares, it resonates with you, if you agree with it or you want us to talk about it, give it a high rating. If it doesn't resonate with you, you disagree or, you're, or you don't want to talk about it, Feel free to give it a low rating. That's A-OK. -okay. All of these, per these perspectives can coexist in this conversation. And uh, 26 thoughts and counting. Let's spend another minute and a half um, starring. So if you haven't started starring at this point, jump to the star step and consider and rate the thoughts of others. These are great. So we have an average rating of seven, uh, seven people per thought. We need to give ourselves another 30 seconds. So um, let's do that. Let's see if we can get that number up to 10. Rate four or five more thoughts, everyone. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Great. So here's the thing. 28 of us, 20, or 17 participants sharing 28 thoughts. That's great. These are going to continue moving around as you as you as you star more thoughts, and that's fine. I might re refer to some notes where I have uh, you know some scriptures, but uh, thank you so much for your willingness to be real in this conversation. One of the pillars of our 
of our church here at Victory Penticton is to keep it real. So I'm really pleased that we're doing that. So God being the reason behind your giving, if he's not, why are you giving? That's great. Uh, I agree. I, I, when I saw this, I gave it a high, a, a high rating. I think it speaks to, um, to the heart posture we have when it comes to our life, including our giving that things that went, uh, that areas of, um, of our spiritual walk that are motivated um, not by faith uh, tend to fail. There's a scripture that I, Pastor Ron's are, uh, oh, my internet is unstable. I hope I'm still with you. Um, Pastor Ron is our live, our, our live in the sort or uh, concordance. And so, um, I might uh, put scriptures to you, Pastor Ron, but this is Pastor Ron's day off, so I won't put him on the spot like I usually do in this conversation. Certainly free to speak up if you like. Um, and now I lost the scripture that I was going to reference, but um, the, the, oh yeah, the scripture that the uh, New, New Testament um, scripture of do not taste, do not touch, do not handle, the legalism around that and how those um, these rules that we live by are destined to perish because they're they're based on earthly rationale. Um, you flip that coin over and you have the do you must do this, and I think that you know do this and do that and do the other thing. And I think the same thing is true. Um, if we're doing these things out of rules or or you know the if then statements and and um, action and consequence the the act will ultimately perish because it's not based on God's economy and this overflow of our hearts. It's based on rules. And in that way, there's thoughts in this exchange about being under law or being under grace. And in that way, I feel like there is this um, sliding scale about the law and the perishability of the law and the, and the right on one side and the wrong on the other side and how that works out. Um, and it comes back to this. What's the reason we're giving? Are we giving in, in faith? Are we giving because we want to give and we're cheerfully giving? Um, or are we giving because it's God's rule and we don't want to fall underneath God's wrath or live underneath the consequence of not giving? Now, it gets a little bit slippery when you talk about um, auditing your past and your, your experience because it's fine to say that God is the reason behind all of our actions. And then when we look at the path behind us and we see that we are not actually giving very much, we have to ask ourselves, why not? And then wonder if, if there is something else that we're missing out on. And so in that way, um, I think there is, a, there is a discipline side of this that's discipline for the right reason, uh, as opposed to um, action for the right reason. And I'll make an, I'll make a parallel. There are days, if I'm just being real, where getting up for church and uh, when we used to be able to meet in person, we're getting up and going to meet with the body of believers and worship. Um, my heart was not in the right place. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard and, uh, and it's easy to sit down and say, you know what, like, what am I, why would I go to church today? My heart isn't in the right place. What's the reason that I would go to church today? But I, I can deconstruct that to say, what's the discipline that I'm going to establish in my life? And what's the reason for that discipline? Well, the discipline I'm going to establish in my life is that I'm going to take make time every Sunday, at least, if not more than that, but at very minimum, I'm going to make time and I will make myself get in a room with a bunch of believers, whether my heart's in the right place or not, because the reason that I'm establishing that discipline is I want my life the weekly cadence of my life to be oriented be around Jesus. And there's not no better way to do that than joining with a bunch of people that also have that commitment on the first day of the week and getting our, our North star in the right spot. And so I, I both agree with this thought and I'd push back on it in saying that when we don't feel like giving, um, 
we might ask, we might need to ask ourselves where the discipline, what, what the reason for the discipline might be. God always looks at the heart when you tithe. Well, we have scriptures, uh, many of them about God judging the heart and God looking at the heart. Um, Matthew 23, 23 has Jesus actually chastising Pharisees for giving the tenth, giving the tithe, um, but then neglecting the, 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 um, the ministry of the, of the church, the justice and the, the looking after widows and orphans and these other things that were part of the ministry of the church. Um, so yes, totally agree. This is an interesting one. And, and uh, this next one, I, I applaud you, whoever you are, for, for having the discipline of tithing. Here's, here's where my experience um, and, and what I hear, I'll just be real about it. I'm, I'll pull some, I'll pull some uh, info here. I'm often in this conversation with believers and around the table, everyone says, well, I tithe. I've always have, and I always will. And I believe you, whoever you are. And I believe you, if you've started this thought high, I believe you. I'm not here to challenge you. And yet, on average, and I knew this as a pastor in my former role, it's not reality that the whole body of believers tithe. The, there's this thing called the 80-20 rule. You've all heard it. You've probably talked about it in, in your workplaces that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. With tithing, my own experience, again, I'm not saying this is your experience and I'm certainly not um, arguing with you over whether you do or you do not tithe. I have no idea. Um, but the church experience is such that less than a quarter of church attendees tithe. Now, they might, more than that might give in the two and three and five and, and the sporadic giving of percent and, and at different times at different places. But less than one quarter on average of church attendees and membership tithe. In addition to that, the number of tithers is decreasing. The generational um, you know, passing down of the generations from baby boomers to, to uh, you know, Generation X and Y and Gen Z and all of these, it's a decreasing number of tithers. And I'm often in a scenario where, where I'm, I'm talking about this and around the table or around the board table at the church board meeting or around the, the, the AGM when we're talking about tithing, we're all in agreement that tithing must you know, should and must happen, and, and off we go. But the experience is such that it's not. And I'm actually here to stand up and say that that's not the experience. Now, I don't know our church's financial statements. I haven't looked at them. But I have a ballpark picture because I know what, what we were considering when we were looking at a new building. I have a ballpark um, uh, item of, of roughly what our church offers on a month-to-month -month basis because it informed some of the questions that we were trying to answer when we were looking at mortgages and lease rates. I can tell you that in our church family, the tie, that 10%, is not being paid across the board. It's just not. Because the money that we were talking about um, being having a dependable, repeatable, source of income around our, our monthly giving doesn't add, doesn't add up to our membership. I'll leave it there. Our, my, my former experience at, in, in uh, my former church was such that we had a really tight financial budget. In fact, we did a, a number of things. I'm going to unshare my screen. I'll share it again in a second. Um, we had a number of, um, of real, real tight financial circumstances that required us to, to rethink how we were funding the work of the church we were leasing. And, uh, and as a result of, of our financial, I'll just say it, peril, we had to go out and find um, other sources of income. When we looked at the tithe, 
and uh, and and the got into the nuts and bolts of of income and tithing. It became really obvious that actually a, a, a handful, like like less than five, um, folks were funding the majority of the of the um, the church's um, ministry, and the giving on top of that was such that. Um, it was undependable. It was. It had these highs and lows moments. We had to really go after it. We had to speak a lot about um, the importance of the tithe at specific things, and we did things like raising money for specific areas in the church, as opposed to just talking about tithe, because it was more emotionally stimulating for people to get behind funding a particular thing, like a missionary, or like a sound system, or like a whatever it was. But overall, in general, had pe people been tithing, none of these specific emotional pleas would have been made because it would have been so fully funded, like it was in Exodus 36, where Moses instructed the Israelites as part of the law to stop it, because there is no way to contain the amount of money coming in. So quit it, everyone. I know that the law is this, which is the message that you can find. I know the law is this, and you're supposed to give your 10%, and actually in Moses' time, if we get into it, it's significantly more than that. Um, but stop it. We're going to change the law because we don't have the storehouses. That experience is the one I want. How many of you want that experience? Yeah? And here we are at, the, at Victory Church of Penticton. We have moved out of our building. We're looking for another one. We are in this building little season of actually not having the monthly lease and all of these kinds of things. And if we were tithing across the board, we would be able to afford a two or a $3 million building. That's my simple math on it. And I'll tell you if we were, and I'm, I'm not saying that my numbers are right, they could be very wrong, but my simple math is that even if we had 50, people at an average of 40 or 50,000 a year paying the tithe in a year we'd have $250,000 now I can tell you and I, I, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn here or not so pastor Ron you can you can pipe in and shut me down anytime you like but as a as when I think about the numbers we were throwing around when we were talking about a lease it's less than half of that, everyone. It's less than half of that on a monthly um, giving um, uh, experience that we've, we've got. Give that two years with the, with the money that we've got in the coffers from the sale of the last building and the, the history that we've got as a church. We can choose where we want to go. To be right in the middle of town. The maximizing of the impact of the furtherance of the kingdom of God. We could, we, we could, we could choose it. And I'm just saying it to say that's not our reality. And so when we talk about uh, I, I tithe, I always have and I always will, I, I love that. We need all of us to do that. I'll leave it there. Get, get back to the exchange. Who's having fun? Trusting God 100%. Here's, the, here's when I do, the blessings are there. Okay, so um, I'll speak from my own experience, okay? I, I'm, I'm preaching to myself in this message because I, uh, I don't claim to be a great financial manager. My wife and I talk about this fairly openly. We, we talk about the first years of when we were married and, and, uh, and somewhat vulnerably, I'll share this. Um, when we were first married, we both had pretty good jobs and we managed to find a place that was very low rent. And for the first years of our marriage, we, we really were just, we sort of ate, drank and be merry. Like we, we followed Jesus and we were committed to God and we were very loose with our finances. Um, we, we didn't, we didn't spend money on 
you know, crazy things. We didn't buy fancy cars and we didn't go on expensive trips and things like that. But we just, we ate out a lot. We did a lot of things that were just like, and, and we talked about it the other day and we were like, we kind of don't regret it because it was really helpful for us to establish our, you know, to not have financial um, barriers on our, on our life in those first few years. It made our first few years of marriage really wonderful. And we look back on it now having um, more time and experience and we say, man, oh man, did we ever let an opportunity disappear? We tithe and all of that, but, um, but we let an opportunity disappear. I'm, I'm sharing that because throughout our lives and throughout my life, I've never struggled for money. I've never, I, I don't always have money. I often have gone without, I've been homeless. I've lived in my vehicle for, at times. I've, I've made a living busking on the streets of Vancouver. Um, and, uh, and so I've, I've experienced the highs and lows of financial resourcing, but I've never been stressed about it. And, and so I'll say this, I, I have for a long time been committed to paying the tithe, paying the 10% on my income. And I think that that's the blessing of, of being able to, to go to God with confidence saying, I did what you asked me to do and, and therefore I'm going to accept your peace. But that doesn't mean that we were wise. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I've, I've been wise. I have had peace. I can say that I've been walking a God-directed path. And I, and I would say uh, that's where it ended because there's been times in my life where I haven't actually put the, that financial wisdom to, to use. And I think that getting into this deeper and deeper when we talk about the, the, the tithe and the giving over and above the tithe, you have to, in, in this sacrificial way, start looking at line items and saying, okay, well, if then, I saw some thoughts in here about if I tithe and there's not enough for this. Well, that's the discipline. That's the discipline, everyone. When we talk about the 10%, it's a significant amount of money right? And it requires that we actually put in place these other things, unless we just have an excess of, of cash, it requires that we put our priorities straight in other areas. And so the blessing is not only that we would have financial peace, the blessing is that God would have part, would be present in our budget line items, and where our priorities are when it comes to our financial life. Amen. 2 Corinthians 8, love it. One of the most quoted scriptures that we have about giving in tithes and offerings and, and whether or not we're under law or whether or not we're under grace and how we ought to give. We should be giving out of the overflow of our hearts and cheerful givers, right? 2 Corinthians has lots to say about this. Give what we've decided in our hearts to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. And he's able to bless us abundantly, that in all things and at all times, we would have all that we need. Amen. I would point to uh, Acts chapter 4 and 5 in, re in relation with a new covenant idea of giving. Um, in Acts chapter 4, as the church is growing, there's the, the scripture says that the body of believers came and gave everything they had to the church, and the church distributed it to those as they had need. And those that had lands and properties sold everything they had and gave it for the ministry of the gospel. And then they go into, the uh, uh, Acts chapter 5 goes into this idea of, of um, Ananias and Sapphira, and the fact that they, like others were doing, were selling lands and coming and bringing and bringing the cash, bringing the, 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 the prophets and laying them at the apostles' feet with this heart of like, I'm, I can give, I can give, and I'm, I'm cheerful, and I'm, I'm able, and, uh, and off they go. In that context, before I get to Ananias and Sapphira, it's everything. You know, it's something that we don't actually talk about in the new covenant of giving and tithing. It's, it's not 10%. It's selling houses and lands and bringing everything and laying it at the apostles' feet. For what? For the furtherance of the gospel. For the, for the, that the will of God would be done. That the kingdom of God would be established at, at 
the cost of everything else. And so this is what I want to talk about in relation to, um, there's thoughts in here about old covenant, new covenant, and that's always one that comes up in, in terms of under grace or under law. I'm, I am dandy with a, with a conversation about giving in tithes and offering that is way above 10% because we're, we're, we're touching on the everything that's required of us. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with that. Our experiences, I just mentioned in the stats that we have on this, suggest that that's nowhere close to the case and that we're back to a place where we're trying to build muscle around our financial freedom and giving. I love that we shouldn't be giving um, under compulsion. And I think that the, the conversation about tithing is, is one that, um, it's like, well, no, that's a, that's a rule. That's a compulsion. It's a, you're laying out a directive and it says right here, we're not to give under compulsion. Amen. And when we audit our financial lives and we see that we are not, um, we're not established in, in such a way that we're getting close to the everything, <laughs> that we're walking away from thousands of dollars or, or when, when a preacher comes or a, mess, a missionary asks or somebody shows up at our doorstep, we're not giving them new cars or um, buying houses for them. We don't have the muscle. We're not actually doing what God's asking us to do. And here's the thing I wanna bring back with Ananias and Sapphira. So as these in, in Acts chapter, end of Acts chapter four and into Acts chapter five, there's this story of Ananias and Sapphira where they wanted also to give in the, with, with this everything in mind, the overflow of everything. And they sold a piece of property and they came and they brought and they set the money at the apostles' feet. And what they were doing in that case was right. It was awesome, except that they were saying that this is all of it. <laughs> and they wanted to be recognized for this, like, this overflow, this abundance of, of how much they were willing to give. And, uh, and they died for it. It's a new covenant thing that happened. They, the Lord smote them dead. Um, and, the, and if you read the first chapter of, um, or the fifth chapter of Acts, you see what happened. Peter says, was not the, did not the land, um, weren't, were you not the owner of the land before you sold it? And then was not the land, uh, were you not in charge of the cash that you purchased from it? So why have you come and said that if this is all of it? You, you can choose what you want to do. And it's the difference between this sort of like heart posture and the compulsion or the rule or whatever it is. I, I think that probably what was being instituted in that day, and this is just the, my interpretation, was that this was the norm, that everybody ought to do, like sell a piece of land, and bring all of it in. And, and then it's sort of a rule and it became a religious order. Um, and sort of a pride thing. And, uh, and the fact of it is, is Ananias and Sapphira could have sold their piece of land and said, we brought half of the profits. Here's half of the profits. Enjoy. And it would have been cheerful and not under compulsion. And it would have been the very way that God wanted us to give. But instead, they came and said, well, we're doing what everyone else is doing. We sold our land and here's all the money. And, and Peter says, you haven't lied to man, you've lied to God. And so, if the defense for not tithing or, um, or not giving in this sort of abundant free will thing is that, um, you know, here's, here's the maximum of what I've gotten and here's what I purposed in my heart. Um, God's not asking actually for, for a specific amount. He's asking for this, this uh, economy to be honest and faithful and he's asking for it to be super generous. <laughs> My first thought, I believe I'm blessed because of the tithing and I always seem to have more than I've required. I think I've touched on this a little bit. Yeah, these are, these are related. I'm blessed because of tithing. When I've given the 10%, God has always come through in my provision. I wanna tell you a story about this. When Andrea and I lived in Edmonton, I was, I was working at a, I was working at the church full time 
and the, the finances there were such that we didn't have quite enough to, um, to pay the bills. And so I had to get another job that was on the side. Um, um, and I got a job driving a school bus. So I would drive a school bus before I'd go to church, go and work at the church. And then I would finish my work day and I'd go and pick up the kids. And, um, and it was getting to be just kind of crazy. I mean, a school bus driver doesn't make much uh, more than um, a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and so we I, we were working pretty hard and we we prayed that god would give us and it sounds like a silly prayer but we prayed that god would give us double the income for half of the work that was our prayer and we're working at the church i have this school bus job god would you like we, we did the math we did the math and what we needed to, to to accomplish to pay our rent and pay the things that we needed and it was, and, but then we wanted, we had, we did the math on the time and, and where, where we felt like, like we had two young kids, a baby and Ginger was just a baby and Simeon was three years old. And, uh, and we said, can we have double the income for half the time? Sounds like a silly prayer, doesn't it? Why did we have such confidence to ask God for that? I'll tell you unequivocally that we asked God with, for that gift with the confidence that at the bare minimum, I'm not saying that we were saying we were generous, we were giving all of our, our you know, selling lands and coming and laying them at the apostles' feet. We pointed our confidence in asking God for that thing, saying in no matter how we have been um, blessed financially, we've given at least 10%. It's been more at times, but it's been a minimum of 10%. We took you at your word in Malachi when you said, test me in this. If you'll bring in the tithe, see if I won't pour out the windows of heaven over you. Malachi 3 something. Malachi 3. Pastor Romans 3, 16. That, that God actually says, test me in this. So when we prayed... We said, God, would you give us double the income for half of the work? We said, is that fair? And here's our confidence. The next job that I got was a personal fitness trainer, which was exactly that. One hour uh, schedules of, of blocks that were the same schedule. Um, half of the schedule in the morning, I would typically be on, on the road three hours in the morning, three hours at night between um, driving to pick up the bus and drop, dropping off the kids. And so in those three hours, I went to two, went to three in the morning and one from six down to four. And in other, other cases from like one and one, um, depending on the day of the week. And the, the, the personal fitness training wage was literally double what the bus driver wage was. And it was almost literally within, you know, a 60, 40 split, half of the work. I'm reminded of the prayer of Jabez. And if you haven't read that little book called the prayer of Jabez, Jabez is this amazing little feature in a list of um, names about who begat who in the Old Testament. And then there's this little prayer of Jabez that says, oh, that you would bless me abundantly. It's what Jabez is famous for. I believe that the confidence, and God, and God blessed him abundantly. There, I believe that there's a confidence that comes with uh, asking for this blessing of God that we can point to the disciplines of faith that we've got. Now, there's a thought in this exchange about prosperity and why we would give and whether or not we give just so God blesses us. No, I think we give out of the overflow of our heart and the free will offering, not reluctantly, not under, or, or, yeah, not reluctantly and not under compulsion. But when we stand before God and we ask for his blessing, and we point to our obedience and our disciplines of faith, I think that there's something that to be said for that. And I can tell you just from my own personal experience, that confidence in doing that was, um, was irreplaceable. Now, if God hadn't have done it, would we have walked away? No, because we have peace about our finances and our, and our time and all of that. However, in every time we've asked God for those, that kind of um, financial increase, and it's come in, in different areas of life, uh, it's, it's come with this idea of a minimum of 10% in mind. A mandatory, tithing for me is a mandatory, I'm going back to the exchange here. 
How are we doing, everyone? Yeah. I found it very difficult when finances are next to nothing and stresses and, do and doubt looms around me. Amen. Uh, that has also been my experience. Malachi 3.10, if anyone's uh, wondering what that scripture was. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about covenant. One of the things that God offers us is um, a freedom from stress, that our anxiety would be reduced. Having more than enough. Yeah, in, I'm, I'm, I'm conflating two scriptures here, but I'll, I'll talk first about um, Philippians 4. In everything, present our requests to God and the peace of God. Be anxious about nothing. Let our gentleness be evident to all. The peace of God that passes all understanding guards our hearts and minds. That particular scripture is not in the context of giving. But then if you put that in context of, of later on in Philippians, it talks about um, having the God who supplies us. Um, in the context of giving to the local church in, in Paul's case, that God is able to meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. This is one of those moments of reality for us. When times are tough, is the purpose of giving to make things tougher or is the purpose of giving to do something else? Uh, if I have enough time, I want to relate this to something else. Because I do believe that giving in that moment, especially giving in that moment, um, is, the, is the key that unlocks the financial peace. Uh, yeah, should I go here or not? Yeah. So in the Garden of Eden, there are two trees. And one of them is good for food. And the other one has another purpose, though it also looks good for food. It looks like food. It has great fruit, but its purpose is something other than food. You following me? There's the, there's the tree of life and there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they, they're both trees and they both have fruit. And so human logic would, would suggest that both of these trees are for eating, but God is really, uh, quite yeah great time is running out um god is really uh, uh giving the second tree the one that isn't for food for another purpose and that purpose is free will obedience submission god didn't create robots he created us with free choice and he, he needed a, a way for us to exercise that free choice now that the tree of knowledge of good and evil has another whole connotation and another whole reality around um, Adam and Eve's eyes being opened when they ate of it but in just the purpose of the tree when you're talking about had they had they continued to obey God the purpose of that tree would have been for them to remain in this free will not reluctant not under compulsion just submissive and, and a heart posture towards God that was um, disciplined and obedient and faithful when it comes to giving when we're stressed and we're and we're short the the there's there's a side of it that's just like cause and effect financial statements and there's a side of it that is like it looks like financial statements and it's this whole thing that defies human wisdom but the purpose is something else and god gives that as a gift and so if it, if we will be faithful in those times of of um of uh stress and doubt to do even some some bare minimums the purpose of that will result in um, in something other than just balance sheet numbers. Now I'm, I'm feeling, I'll just name it. I'm feeling a little bit stressed to, on the time because uh, I want to go deeper on this, but in the interest of time, I, I will carry on. 
At 11.37, we usually close. I think what I'll do is I'll use this exchange to pop in some of the scriptures that I've got on these different areas. And, uh, and I'll share back a summary report with you all and, um, and do my best to answer some of the questions and thoughts in there. I want to say a great heartfelt thanks to all of you for um, being so real in the conversation. And with that, I'm just going to pray that the, uh, the conversation and the thoughts that we've had here and the, the challenge to consider where we're at in terms of our tithes and offerings would be breathed on by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to name my own um, insecurity in all of this as well. As I lean into this, I know it's what God's asking me to do. And I find that I'm, I'm also... Um, as I mentioned at the outset, preaching to myself and willing to be real in front of you all and saying that this is not something that we that collectively we have figured out and it's certainly not something that I have figured out. And so I just want to name that as well as we lean into the conversation together. And with that, Jesus, do what you do. Sanctify us, breathe on us, Holy Spirit, breathe on these, um, these thoughts and, and uh, emotions Make your truth known. Give us the ability to find your will and your way in all that we're talking about here today. And sanctify us. Give us your heart and your desire. When it comes to tithes and offerings, inspire us. Bring us to the everything, Jesus. Help us build the muscles to be cheerful and giving. And would you bless each one? In Jesus' name. Amen.